Hello Queens, welcome to another episode. How are you today, by the way? How are you feeling physically, emotionally? You know, when I first started therapy, I remember my therapist said to me, how do you feel? And I was like, um, I feel okay. And she was like, what's the feeling? And I was like, um, I really don't know. And so many of my clients experience the same thing as well. So if I was to ask you, how are you feeling? Could you name an actual emotion? And if not, then I invite you to just get curious and ask yourself a couple of times a day to start with how you're feeling. Use the emotional wheel. That's a really good thing, a good tool. Just Google emotional wheel or wheel of emotions and it will show you all the different emotions. And then it helped me. That's what I use to begin with to actually really to help me articulate how I was actually feeling. So just a little bit of a tip there um, in terms of how to embody a little bit more and go from your head and into your body and feel all right so today oh my gosh I loved writing this and it went in a different way to what I had envisioned it going but nonetheless it's a great episode and it still resonates with its title which is the fear of future weight gain so before we get into it may I ask you a favor to just five star my podcast if you think it's worthy of five stars um, on Spotify like Podbean iTunes wherever you listen to your podcast I know like everyone asks this but there's a reason because more people can find me and then I can help them with my free content so I'd really 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 appreciate it so thank you in advance okay so let's dive in the fear of weight gain then um, no matter where you are on your food freedom journey, so whether you've just started, maybe you're not actually, you haven't taken the plunge yet, but you're considering it, or maybe you've been on your food freedom journey for a while now. If you still have a fear of weight gain, it can hold you back from really truly being free around food. But once you overcome that fear of weight gain, not necessarily, may I add, actual weight gain but the fear of it your whole food struggles will completely disappear so the question is of course how the f do we overcome our fear of weight gain when it's the exact thing that got us in to this mess with food in the whole first place and the fear of fatness which is fat phobia is everywhere well, having personally gone through this myself and coached many clients through this fear of weight gain, I'm going to share with you some foundational principles that you can start to see the potential weight gain or actual weight gain isn't actually the end of the world. Yes, really. <laughs> I know how bizarre I may sound right now, but let's do this. OK, so let's dive in with let's start straight away with actual weight gain. So if you was to just consider for a moment that you woke up tomorrow and you were a lot bigger than you were currently and you'd gain, gained a lot of weight, if you're anything like I used to be, it sounds like that would be the worst thing that could possibly happen to you is actually gaining weight, right? I used to believe that there really was nothing worse than gaining weight. And to give you some context as to how petrified I was at the thought of gaining weight, when a friend or family member got sick and lost weight, I would literally wish I could catch the sickness and be sick too, so that I could lose weight. I would actually spend time with the sick person on purpose, hoping, this sounds horrendous as I was writing this and now saying it out loud, hoping that I would get sick so that I might lose weight because I was actually sick. Another example, when my friend had her tonsils out before, she could only drink, um, she couldn't actually eat physical food for so many days. I also wish that I would needed to have had had my tonsils out or to have a procedure where for some reason my mouth was sewn together or something anything that would stop me from eating and I wouldn't have a choice about it whenever I used to train at the gym or run and my body was super tired I would motivate myself with thoughts such as keep going 
just pretend that if you stop doing the thing, the burpees, the running, whatever it is, you'll instantly gain weight. I use that as a fear of motivation. And let me tell you, it kept me going, that's for sure. And you know, in my mind, the motivation seemed similar to someone who was literally running for their life. Because for so many years, I felt like I was running for my life as far away from any weight gain as possible, then I would feel safe. And maybe you can relate. Over the course of my life, I've yo-yoed, I've yo-yoed between a UK size six and a UK size 16. However, aggressively I restricted and lost weight was the same extent in which I binged and then gained the weight back plus a bit more because your body is overcompensating. Your body's smart AF, even though we think it's the worst thing that it can do to us is to gain an extra little bit of weight just in case the owner of the body, aka you living inside that body is going to restrict again. It just cares about survival, right? If I was being super restrictive, I'd experience super binges. It's actually physics. I'm going to read, quote, in the third law of physics, when two objects interact, they apply forces to each other of equal magnitude and opposite direction. So put into the context of what I share, if you are forcefully restricting, meaning if you are using your willpower to deny yourself what you truly want to eat, you will be met with the same amount of force going against your will to restrict from your biology. So let me just say that again. If you are forcefully restricting, meaning if, you're, if you are using your willpower to deny yourself what you truly want to eat, you will be met with the same amount of resistance going against you from your body, from your biology. And in my personal opinion, that of my clients and the results of numerous studies, biology wins 95% of the time. Hence, 95% of people can't be successful dieters. They're not. It's physically impossible for 95% of the population of the studies that had been done. And even then, that can be argued because some people say it's 97% because of the way the studies were done and all of that. So just let that land for a moment it is physics. And when I first started my food freedom journey, I was about UK size 10 to 12. And I gained some weight during the process of food freedom. And I went up to a size 14 to 16 within about six months. Now, and as I speak this, I'm five years into my recovery as I write this, I'm an average UK size 12, depending on what clothing um, type it is, whether it's a dress, jeans, top, whatever, and where it's from. So as you can see, I did gain weight and then I naturally found my set point weight through the principles that I teach through food freedom. However, this isn't an advertisement or I don't want to spark hope into you that during this process, you will gain weight and then you will lose weight again. Who knows? Because your body is going to do what your body is going to do. And that's the scariest thing because it's it's the unknown, right? And many of my clients experience what I have experienced, a little bit of a weight increase, and then it goes back down and balances back out. Some clients lose weight because of the ex to the extremity of what they were binging when they came to me, the binges stop and naturally they just get smaller. Some people say the same weight. So just to clarify, I don't quote sell weight loss, okay? And so, as I was saying, when I started this journey to food freedom and body love, I didn't want to gain weight, obviously, but I knew that what I was doing actually wasn't working anyway, because when I, when I say working, I say that in quotes, because I wasn't actually losing weight. I couldn't lose weight no matter how much I was trying in fact, I was actually putting on weight due to all of the binges. So I also felt crazy around food, obsessed with the way I looked. I was constantly closing myself off to loved ones. And I genuinely thought I needed to check in to a mental institution or something. 
clearly over my lifetime, I like to learn the hard way or did, I don't anymore. End of story, I just knew that I could not carry on the way I was carrying on anymore. So I didn't want to gain weight. I just knew I couldn't carry on, right? I wanted out. I cared so much about what my body looked like and I desperately didn't want to care. I was ready to face anything as long as I could live in peace around food and around my body and in my body and actually live a life that didn't result didn't revolve around all of this shit that controlled me since I was nine years old. So when the weight game, when the weight gain came, that sounds like I was going to do a rap or something. I would be horrendous at rapping. I get tongue tied at the best of times just reading my own writing as I'm recording this. But when the weight gain came during the start of my food freedom journey, of course, it freaked me the fuck out. I mean, let's be honest. It wasn't like I was like magically surprised or shocked that I was gaining weight or anything. But when your biggest fear actually starts to come true, it's kind of fucked up to begin with though. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. And honestly, the process at the beginning, what I experienced, and I know that so many of my clients experience, which is why they have me to guide them through it every step of the way. I can imagine it to be someone to, I can imagine for it to be like someone who is scared of heights And they sign up to something to overcome their fear of heights. And the first assignment is to go bungee jumping or skydiving. (laughs) Literally, that's what this process reminded me of. Because at the start of this process, weight gain can happen. Not always, and it doesn't always, but it can. But you've not had chance to go through all the body image work yet that I teach and support you through. So it's almost like your biggest fear is coming true, like at the beginning of this journey. And that can feel so overwhelming. Right. And as I was writing this, it's quite funny, actually, because I've actually put on weight many times in my life, numerous times in my life, as I've explained, yo-yo dieted from a size six to a 16, God knows how many times. And each time I did gain weight, it was dreadfully, I was dreadfully deeply depressed about it all of the times that I experienced weight gain. But then at the same time, I guess during those times that I had gained weight, I had the security and the comfort knowing that I was going to quote, do something about it and lose the weight again anyway. This time, however, when I first started my food freedom journey and body love journey, all I had was a coach to support me that I paid. And there's an, the, the investment is there for a reason, not just because of the coach's time and the value and the wisdom, but for, to hold you accountable so you continue along this devoted journey that it has to be a devotion or a commitment to get where you want to be. I had paid a coach to support me. And what I was doing before I signed up to the coaching, aka dieting and binging, wasn't working anyway. And it wasn't even sustainable unless I literally wanted to check myself into a psychiatric hospital. So when I gained weight, it felt horrible during the the first part of this process. I'm not even going to sugarcoat that. It was it was really hard. It was literally like it. I felt like it was a choice between living with an eating disorder but potentially in a smaller body or hating my body but living in food freedom I had chosen freedom but there was nothing freeing about it to begin with so that can come if you've not started your journey yet that can be part of it but I knew I just had to keep going and trust my coach and trust the process. I did everything she asked me to do, the mirror work, affirmations, mindset reprogramming, and even meditation, where to begin with, I would literally roll my eyes at the mere thought of meditating. I did it all. I lent on her a lot for support. 
And I thought I'd sold my soul to the devil who in return gave me the joy of hating my body for the rest of my life. Yet I could live in food freedom. But as I said, didn't feel free at the time at the beginning of this process. All I knew is I couldn't continue what I was doing because what I was doing wasn't working anyway, right? However, over time, and it wasn't that much time, like literally within a matter of a few more weeks, because I was doing all of the practices and learning all about acceptance and surrender and what that meant and how to actually do that, the weight gain didn't seem so bad after all. It was still bad, don't get me wrong, but it wasn't as bad as I first thought it, it was or could be. Exposure therapy definitely played a huge part in this alongside surrendering to each moment and the mirror exercises I was doing. So in terms of exposure therapy, it is exactly as it sounds, exposing yourself to your body as much as possible on a daily, regular basis with clothes, without clothes, and just being okay with looking. And you need support around this, especially if you've had a lot of trauma around your body from a very young age, you need support through this. So after about four weeks, I was able to look at my body in the mirror naked without feeling like I was going to have a panic attack or desperately want to crawl out of my skin because I couldn't handle the pain of seeing myself look that way. And I also noticed that just because I had gained weight, I hadn't suddenly morphed into a monster who looked nothing like me. I was still the same shape. It was still my body. Yes, I was just curvier. I carried fat in the same way and in the same places. I was still me, just a bigger version of me. And I remember thinking, maybe I can be okay with this one day. Not now, not yet. And I know I might, I think I might get there one day. And then maybe gaining weight isn't actually as bad as I thought it would be. You know, I generally thought that after about four to five weeks and remember how I shared with you how petrified I was of weight gain, how I gained it in my life. And it was like deeply depressing for me to the point where I would then, of course, diet and restrict again. This process, quote, works, gets you to where you want to be in terms of acceptance. So when I first thought that, okay, maybe gaining weight isn't as bad as I thought it would be, it wasn't. My friends still loved me. My fiance still loved me and wanted to be intimate with me. I mean, I had to work through my own blocks around allowing him to see me and all of that, but he still wanted to be intimate with me. I was still good at my job. I could still walk and run and exercise. I could still cuddle my dog. Yes, my body felt different for me because it was bigger when I was doing these things, but I could still do these things. I could still put on a dress and some makeup and then go and enjoy a meal out. And in fact, I enjoyed social occasions that involved food a million times more than I used to because I was feeling freer and freer around food as time went on. So when I looked back and realized that actually my life isn't that much different at all. In fact, it was better because I was no longer shutting loved ones out emotionally or sneaking food and then lying about food, or spending every goddamn waking minute of my day thinking about food and my weight, that's when I decided to journal the magic question, I've gained weight and. Try it, if no matter how far you are onto this journey, what have you gained as well as weight? And if you've not started this journey yet, and you're still freaking the fuck out hearing this episode... I feel you but keep listening because it gets better and I tell you it's the best the most profound thing I have ever done for myself in my whole entire life is give up dieting and start this journey to beat to food freedom and body love that tops anything and everything that has changed my life in more ways that I can even describe So I've gained weight and what else have you gained? I no longer binge I can go for spontaneous date nights. I'm no longer counting calories, all of those things. And if you've not started the journey yet, 
just play make believe here or you can even start the journal exercise with instead of I've gained weight and you could say I'm ready to leave behind dot 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 or I'm ready to lose so obviously not weight but I'm ready to lose obsessing about food I'm ready to lose the body obsession I'm ready to lose the binge eating you can play with that let me know how it goes but this question I've gained weight and was a game changer for me because over time as I continue to dive deeper into this work around body image and self-love and visit past trauma and work through all of that which is everything that I do with my clients I finally realize that I could live in food freedom without hating my body for the rest of my life now I live in complete food freedom I eat whatever I want when I want it and ironically I'm the healthiest I've ever been physically mentally emotionally seriously what the fuck happened? I actually love my body. I never thought that was possible for me unless I was smaller than I am now. And body love to me, just to clarify what that means in my world, body love to me is loving my body unconditionally, being super grateful for everything she does for me, including keeping me alive every second of the day since I was born. And knowing that she is sexy and imperfect and a representation of my life story and my past experiences and the good times I've had and the bad times I've had and everything in between. And most days, body love to me means feeling good about how my body looks. And this is possible for you too. It's not just my story. It's the story of my clients and the women that I work with. So your brain may be going and jumping to, oh, it can work for those, but it can't work for me. Trust me, 99.9% of my clients say that to me when they first come to me. And I said that to myself and my coach too. It is, if you want it enough, it's a thousand million percent possible. And if you have me as a coach, it's even more possible because I'm so invested in you and this process and this journey I will get you to where you want to be through love, support, wisdom, accountability, everything that I do with my clients, with my coaching. It is possible for you. So I've talked about actual weight gain and my experience with that. I want to talk now about the fear of future weight gain. So the intense fear, and it it can and it is very intense, a fear of future weight gain is actually worse than the weight gain itself. The fear of the thing is worse than the thing itself. This is because fear is false experience appearing real. So it's an acronym. So fear is spelled F-E-A-R. It's a false experience appearing real. And it's super scary because it's unknown. And the ego, which is most of your mind, the lower part of our mind, our brain, absolutely is petrified of the unknown even if the unknown is guaranteed to be super pleasurable the ego still fears that because it doesn't know for certain so the ego attaches to the fear of the unknown and then makes that a big deal that's where fear comes from fear is unknown Um, not well it is but the, the scary part of the fear is the thing that you're scared about is unknown it's not happening yet so you're creating the scenario in your head of it happening and so it's much worse than the actual thing itself if that was to happen and it feels like you're losing the ground under your feet and the word panic pretty much sums it up when I remembered when I used to be so fearful of weight gain, it's like this intense panic, like you can, there's the overwhelm of the fear of that thought of weight gain. That's what it is, but it's actually the unknown. It's not here now, you're creating that in your mind because fear is not real. Fear is all in the mind. And guess who has control over the mind? You have control over your mind. 
You cannot control the thoughts that you think as they appear automatically due to your past experiences and how much you bought into these, how much attention you paid into these thoughts over time. But you can control how you respond to thoughts and whether you take an action or a non-action after you've responded to those thoughts. Thoughts are not facts. Don't believe everything you think. Choose to think. Play a game with me now. Let's do it. Take a few seconds. Choose to think that I'm looking at a tree right now. Choose to think that I'm going to climb that tree outside. So if you can look outside or if you're driving, obviously pay attention to the road, but just generate, create a thought that you can think now, whether it's I'm going to climb that tree, I'm going to jump out that window, please don't. Just generate a thought, right? You've done it. So let's go with the I'm going to climb the tree. My question to you is, are you going to climb the tree? Because you can choose to ignore the thought and not climb the tree, or you can choose to go outside and climb the tree. Your thoughts are not real. You don't have to do everything your thoughts tell you to do. You don't have to believe them, right? And if you, every single time, if you thought I'm going to climb that tree and then you made yourself take the action and climb the tree, over time, you will believe that every time you think I'm going to climb the tree, you will believe you have to do it. Why? Because you've given yourself countless proof, if you like, countless times you have thought the thought and then done the action. Therefore, your belief is if I think I'm going to climb the tree, I need to climb the tree because your brain has so many reference points as to where you've thought the thing and then done the action. And that's only that's what thoughts are like that's what beliefs are so even the beliefs that feel so true to you because of the reference points of proof you have to back it up they can absolutely be changed okay so I, I kind of went off a bit a little bit of a tangent into beliefs there but I'm so passionate about this because once you get your head around it it feels true for you but it's not actually true it's just the way that your the synapses fire in your brain due to rep repetition over and over again from the conditioning that you've had so fear is not real it's in the mind yet danger is real you can be walking on a wooden bridge over a vast mountain range and the bridge can start collapsing and you will be in danger in that moment your body will then respond straight away and put you into fight, flight, or freeze response. So your nervous system will get jacked up. You'll go into the sympathetic nervous system response in order for you to handle the dangerous situation in the moment. And what will you do? You will handle this dangerous moment that is happening in the moment. You will handle it in the moment of it happening or not, and you could probably die and then you won't be handling anything. <laughs> I don't joke about, well, I do, but you know what I mean? It's a joke. And then when you get back to solid ground, you'll be feeling fear over what just happened in the past. So just be with that for a minute. You're on the bridge. It's collapsing. You're literally like, fuck, am I going to die? You, you instantly react to the situation. You look for things to hold on to. You, you react in the moment. All you know is danger, need to react now. And then when you're safe on solid ground, then you feel the fear because you're replaying in your mind what's just happened. So fear wasn't actually present in the moment. The danger was, and you reacted to the danger. Can you see? It's, it's mad. It's crazy how, how it all works out. A book that I recommend that I have recommended before many times, but I will recommend it again, is the book called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. You can get it on Audible, Kindle, paperback, hardback, I think. Read the book, listen to the book. It's a great book. Some people have an aversion to the sound of his voice. I quite like it. It's very relaxing to me. It's quite monotone. But check it out. And either way, however you consume the book, consume the book. It's phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. Okay, moving on. We've talked about the actual weight gain. We've talked about the fear of weight gain. The next thing I want to talk about, it's more of a question. What do you make weight gain mean? Your fear of weight gain 
is because you think that weight gain itself is something to be scared of. Duh, right? Hmm, I wonder why you think that. Oh yeah, hello, societal conditioning. We don't care about fat in a vacuum. We care about what we make fat mean. So if we lived on a desert island with no access to media or a society that has been developed the way ours have, we wouldn't even know the concept of fat and thin. Just think about that for a moment while I have a sip of my water. So I have a few questions for you that I invite you to journal on, okay? So pause this, do whatever you have to do, or at least think about it. What do you make fat mean? What do you make weight gain mean? What do you make thinness mean? What do you make losing weight mean? Are your answers to those two questions absolutely true? Why or why not? Who would you be and what would your life be like if you didn't know the concept of fat or thin? These questions are on the blog version of this podcast. So you can go head over to my head over to my website, www. You can go to my website and it's on there. So you don't have to pause it and all of that. But seriously, this stuff, like what we make fat mean and why is it so traumatic for us? Everyone has a different story, but so many similar experiences of trauma around body image and weight gain. We deep dive into this stuff together, me and my clients, because it's a huge part of this journey. And now I want to move on to the word self-worth and link that with body image. So I have kind of, I've got a, quite a lot of questions coming up for you. So wake your mind up, get, get thinking. How much does the way your body looks dictate your self-worth? So if you was to give yourself a percentage of how much of your self-worth was reliant on your body image, what would it be for you? So if you could have a percentage of how much your body image was dictated by your self-worth, no, Victoria, that's the opposite way around. If you was to give yourself a percentage of how much your self-worth was dictated by your body image, what would the percentage be? Mine used to be 95%. The other 5% was in my worthiness scale was what I had accomplished at work and what I did for other people. And I am here to remind you, my love, that your body is not a billboard. Your body is your home. Your body is the least interesting thing about you. And your body does not define your worth. If your self-worth and your sense of value come from the way your body looks, which is what we've been taught and conditioned to believe, we are doomed, seriously. This is a huge deal for women, especially because even if our bodies didn't change, we still age. <laughs> Look how many wrinkle creams there is. And oh God, that's, don't, I don't even need to tell you about that. You already know. We need to look for other ways to meet our self-worth needs apart from the way our body looks. And the ultimate truth is that we are worthy just as we are, just because we are alive and because we were, we were born. Many of us don't grasp that. It took me a while. So because of this, I'll continue but using the word self-esteem and identity. So if your sense of identity comes from what you look like, you're never going to be truly happy, which is why releasing the grip are the releasing the grip you have on the way you look, but and prioritizing other things, it's key to your recovery from disordered eating and your journey to food freedom. So it's not about not giving a shit about what you look like. I mean, I've got, well, I brushed my hair today. I've got a bit of makeup on. I've got, I've dressed today, you know, like it's not about not giving a shit about what you look like. It's rearranging the priorities and the importance of what looking a certain way means to you and so there's some important questions you need to answer in order to do this 
And here come the questions again. I really invite you to journal these and it's on, it's on the blog, the written version of this. How else do you want to value yourself apart from your body? How else do you want to measure your self-esteem? The question is, sorry, the question isn't, how can you stop feeling awful about your body? The question is, how can you meet your universal needs without it being about your body? Can you see why these are journaling questions? What universal needs are you trying to meet from the pursuit of thinness? It's not only about making peace with your body. It's about what you are trying to get, attain from thinness. Thinness is not an innate human need. However, acceptance and love are. The problem is we think we will acquire these love and acceptance via thinness. So thinness isn't an innate human need. However, acceptance and love are. The problem is we think we will acquire acceptance and love via thinness. Some more questions for you. How can you start to meet those needs in other ways because dieting just doesn't work for you and 95% of the population too? How can you start to meet those universal human needs in a more healthier, nourishing way over time what are you trying to avoid through chasing thinness why do you care about losing weight so much and now as we're getting towards the end of this episode I really want to touch on values do you know what your values are if I was to say to you, what are your values in life? Would you be able to answer? Don't beat yourself up if you can't, because most of you have like that negative Nelly in your head constantly turned on from the second you wake up to the second you're trying to go to sleep. But if you don't know your values, spend some time like connecting to yourself and figuring out what's really important to you. Because the huge feeling of disconnection and that feeling of lostness in life can come from not being in alignment with your values. We all have values, whether or not we are aware of them, all of us. So I suggest you become aware of them and then take a look at what living in alignment with them means to you. So for example, my top value is freedom. Shock. <laughs> and I think that it has been a value of mine for most of my life. However, when I was dieting and trying to control my body and restricting and creating rules for myself around what I could and couldn't eat, all of that that you already know about, that was the exact opposite of freedom. Society and my family conditioning had taught me to value what my body looked like above all else. And so I dedicated my life until five years ago doing just that. Yet I was so far out of alignment with my actual true soul's desire, value of freedom. No wonder I was never really truly happy. If someone truly values control and discipline, then they will be in alignment with controlling and disciplining themselves. So find out what your values are, my love. It can be so powerful. In fact, every one of my clients, we start off by finding I have an exercise that I do with them to figure out what their values are. And then we go into a deeper exercise as to what that might look like and how it can be linked to the process that we're on together. And we create affirmations from that. 
create a whole new identity of what they're stepping into that are in alignment with their values. There's no good just being like, oh, I would love to do this. And therefore I'm going to create an affirmation and pretend that I'm that person that can work for some. But if the, if it's not in alignment with your values or you can't see the connect and, and connect the dots to what your values are in the process we're doing together, there's going to be something that's out of alignment. There's going to be a discord somewhere, which is why it's at the base of what we do. Another thing that I asked myself when I was struggling with the fear of weight gain and the actual weight gain and all of that, a question that you can ponder for yourself is, what would you want to be read at your funeral? Would you be thrilled with something along the lines of, she was so disciplined, she always said no to birthday cake, and she managed to maintain her size eight figure all of her life. She spent many hours in, hours in the gym, and she kept her trim athletic figure. What an achievement. I mean, obviously, I'm exaggerating to prove a point in this podcast, but that's one option, similar things that could be said. Or would you be happy with something along the lines of she was so happy and carefree, she made others feel accepted and loved in her presence because love and acceptance just shone out of her and that's just who she was. You know, something to think about. What are you living for? Is it worth it? Really, truly, especially if you're not even happy during the process of dieting and therefore most likely binging and therefore most likely 37% of dieters actually generate an eating disorder. I'm sure the statistics has gone up since I last checked with the research. And the very last thing I wanted to talk about is future tripping. So future tripping is an actual clinical term also known as anticipatory anxiety, which is when one worries something that hasn't, it's when, let me start again. Future tripping is when somebody worries about something that hasn't even happened yet or isn't happening. It's the mind, it's the whole fear, anxiety, mind thing again. Compulsive future tripping and planning is simply an attempt at grasping for safety and control. You will know what I'm talking about here. Anyone listening to this, anyone watching this, because it's a YouTube video as well, if you want to check out my incredible, look at that plant there. It's a plant that smells of lemon, like lemon balm. And I got it because mosquitoes are obsessed with me and I heard that that kept mosquitoes away. And I literally love it every day and say hi to it and water it, obviously. And it's gone huge. Anyway, if you're on the podcast, sorry, because you have no idea what I'm talking about right now. But in terms of future tripping and turning to your body when you feel overwhelmed, you will know what I'm talking about. Because when we feel overwhelmed in life in general, out of control or unsafe, it's easy, natural, because of what we've been taught to do for so many years, and habitual to just turn towards our body. We're trying to make the future secure by thinking about controlling our bodies or actually attempting to control our bodies. Therefore, like I've said many times, dieting is the real obsession or addiction in quotes, not food, not binge eating. It's the control of your body is the real problem. And it's very I want to say addictive because I mean, addictive is a bit of a strong word, but it can almost be addictive to just turn to that in order to suppress life in general and to feel like you're in control of something. Because don't forget that dieting and weight loss promises a life free of problems. So no wonder we turn to manipulate our bodies when we feel overwhelmed or unhappy in life. I'm sure you've said many times before, I'll be happy when dot, 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 something in the future, when everything is in control and safe. It's more so I'll be happy when I've lost X amount of pounds, because therefore I think I will feel in control and then safe and happy. But that's not the case. It's that sense of comfort that something in the future will provide more safety than the present moment. It's a way to resist reality 
And to actually relieve some of the emotional pain that you may be experiencing, that's why we do future tripping. It's a, it's a self-protective mechanism. It's an attempt at control. It's an attempt at self-care, but it's not a very good one or helpful one. It just kind of makes you feel worse. The anxiety can be relieved a little bit with planning a diet and all of that. But ultimately, it's just a safety net with big fucking holes in it that you're going to keep falling through, but then you're going to keep going to the safety net and falling through again. You know the story. So what to do when you're future tripping is the first step, as with anything, is to notice that it's happening. So be like, oh, ding, ding, ding. There goes my control brain again. And then you will notice the anxious energy in your physical body. You'll be tense. Your shoulders will be probably up here. Your back will be tense. Your jaw will be tense. Like you'll feel the tenseness, the energy in your physical body. You'll be like on guard. You'll feel the complete opposite to relaxed and peaceful. So notice that it's happening. And when you simply notice that you're in control brain and your future tripping, take it as a signal, as a gift, as an invitation to relax, surrender and be in the present moment. You can take a deep breath to physically relax your body and then say, this is the body that I have today. I can't control it anyway, now or in the future. This is the body that I have today. I can't control it anyway, now or in the future. And if you think you can control your body, come and talk to me. I mean, there's so much to say. I have like a whole module purely on this. You can't control your body and come at me with questions if you have any, and I will kindly and lovingly give you the answers that you may be looking for. That may help you to really have things fall into place for you with the work that I teach. And then you can ask yourself, how can I make peace with the body I have right now? And of course, there's so much more you can do around body acceptance, but start there. It also helps one key thing that I want to finish on. It helps to actually have clothes in your wardrobe that fit you. If you open your wardrobe and it's full of clothes that no longer fit the body you have now, have a sort out. Put their smaller clothes in bags and store them in the garage if you don't want to get rid of them give them to charity, sell them, anything. You just don't want to be looking at them every day as they will not help you in any way. Oh my goodness, remember all the times that I've done this many times and I'm sure you have as well. And if you are doing it, stop it. Hanging a dress or a pair of jeans, excuse me, that is a size too small to motivate you to fit into them. But it doesn't work, does it? It just makes you feel like shit and just makes you feel like you can't stick to anything or achieve anything. So don't do that. It doesn't motivate you. Anything that you are doing from a place of fear is not going to work long-term and it will not make you happy. Anything you do from a place of love is going to quote work and it will make you happy. That's a simple way you can check in with yourself. If you see the pair of jeans there or the dress hanging there, am I trying to get into those from a place of fear because I, I'm not good enough as I am. I need to look better. I'm not good enough as I am now. So therefore I need like that kind of energy, get rid of it. The love and fear, the only, I believe, two underlying emotions at the root of every emotion, am I acting out of love or fear? So get rid of the clothes that don't fit you. You'll find it very liberating and beneficial to your food freedom and body love journey, if you have clothing options that you actually like, you feel good in, and they fit you. This can be a very difficult process to go through because of course you're gonna have to try some clothes on. You'd have, that. how I recommend my clients do it is, first of all, speak to me and I'll get them all like inspired and the space is here ready for them if they need me, if they're having a freak out moment. We go through some coaching first and then they'll do a few things. So number one, they'll create enough space and time to do it in. They won't do it if they're having like a down day. Um, they'll have music on, like maybe have a trusted friend. They'll create a, a happy environment and they'll look at their 
their clothes. And if one, they absolutely know it, it's not going to fit, don't even try them on. Anything you know is going to be too small, get rid of it, put it away somewhere, like in the pile, whatever you're going to do with your clothes, whether it's in the garage, sell them, charity, whatever, just get rid straight away with small ones you know aren't going to fit you. Don't hold on to them in case you lose weight again, because if your body changes again, you can also just buy new clothes or at least put them in the garage, okay, out the way. Number two, if you might think they will fit you, try them on, breathe through any triggers, take away any judgment that's going to come and all the thoughts that are going to come and the painful emotions that they don't fit you anymore. And then also get rid of them. And even if you have clothes that fit you, but you don't actually love them or you don't like them, get rid of them too, because you deserve to have a wardrobe that doesn't even have to be full. That just has a few options of clothes that you like, you feel good in, and they actually fit you. It's so important. You'll feel very liberated. So stop future tripping, my love. Come back to the present moment. And if you would like support in your journey, this is where I can help you. So there's a few different ways that you can work with me. The, the basic foundational way is in the Body Love Buffet, which is a group coaching support. You have my food freedom and body love program to go through, which is called the Body Love Binge. It's like four months worth of content. It is jam packed full and you have access to that forever. We have a private podcast. I'm in the group. It's private away from Facebook. I'm in there every week, weekly coaching in the group if you've got any struggles to celebrate your wins that's the most foundational way you can work with me if one-to-one -one is interesting to you just send me an email send me a dm on facebook or instagram and i can give you more info about that but ultimately the value that i share in these podcasts is a lot and i know it can be a bit overwhelming to try and work through it yourself just take your time i'm here for you if you need me rate my podcast five star because it really helps and share me on your social media if you feel called to, to help all the women that might need this. All right, beauties, I love you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.